I heard about this middle-aged woman. She had a heart attack, and on the operating table, she asked God if this was it. God said, no, you got 40 more years. So upon recovery, she stayed in the hospital and had a facelift and a tummy tuck and a liposuction and an extreme makeover. Two months later, as she was leaving the hospital, she was tragically hit by a car. And when she got to heaven, she said, God, I thought you said I got 40 more years. And God said, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> that was embellished laughter. <laughs> Stacy, I love you. Raise your Bible, say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. Lord, I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that that's true for me. I can't make the decision for anybody else in this room. But Lord, I stand at attention and say, teach me, oh God. I need to know you more. Amen? Week number one, we talked about what it was like to be wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I see you came clothed today, so that's good. Have you worked on buying salve so that you can see from Jesus and get from him this gold refined in the fire and you can be truly rich and healed and clothed? Week number two, we talked about choosing integrity, which is safety. Choose to be a person of integrity, and it had to do with accountability. Has anybody found an accountability partner or become one since two weeks ago? Raise your hand. I have not, not okay, let me ask more generically. Not that you officially became something, but that you were attentive to others needing encouragement meant in text or a call, now raise your hand. I've, I've been listening. God's been moving. Excellent. This is a, Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. All right. You have ability then to all of you stand in for somebody and help them by being a mentor or being an encourager. And when God speaks to you, go for it. Just do it. Throw it out there. Week number three, last week, we talked about God's mercy and his um, grace given to us in his son on the cross so that we could not only be free of judgment, amen, we don't want to be in the lake of fire, we also understand that grace is above and beyond, that, that beyond favor, that unmerited favor of God. So I hope we're choosing grace instead of judgment in your life this week. Choosing judgment is choosing to stay in sin. And live in bondage. Choosing grace is saying, God, forgive me. I walk on with you. Help me to understand your ways. Do you see the difference? No. Let's talk about it. No, I'm just kidding. You understand the difference? Six of you. Do we understand the difference? Yeah. Woo! Okay, I can go on. Today, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Because if you don't get some of the other stuff we talked about, you're certainly not going to get spiritual warfare understood. What is spiritual warfare and why we got to talk about warfare? I think we know about the Middle East, right? There's warfare, people losing their heads, people getting blown up in airports, people getting shot down, 40 people just found in mass graves in Mosul. What, 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 what town was that? Palmyra. It was. Unfathomable stuff happening around us and casualties. Why do we talk about spiritual warfare? Because in every life I'm looking at, you have casualties. And sometimes we go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Why are there two funerals in my week this week? Because we're at war. Because we live in a broken, fallen world. Go back to Genesis 1. God made and we entered into sin. And it broke us. So it's important for us to remember today that we are in a war. And you're in a battlefield just in every single mind represented here. Raise your hand if you have a mind. Woo! Okay, we're with it. Yeah. 
Some of us were like, I'm not sure. I think I'm sitting on mine. All right. And we got a mind. The battlefield of the mind is raging for all of us. If you're going to win it, you must understand some things like this. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, be, read this with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against each other, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Notice that the war is not between me and Matthew. All right, we're going to have to get along, brother. The war is not between me and Sean. This war doesn't happen here. You have an enemy in the prince of the power of the air. And you and I are in a spiritual war. And I was complaining to God a little bit this week about some of the events happening in our life and why certain things weren't working out and certain things I thought were going to go through fell through. Anybody have one of those? Yeah. And God reminded me, you might not be where you want to be, but would you thank me that you're not where you used to be? Woo! That's powerful. You might not be where you want to be yet, but thank you, Jesus. I'm not caught in sin like I used to be. Think back to some of your real dark days. You're here this morning. You have hope. You are here. You have what it takes to be a victor. Do you know... God, in, in the, uh, when he told the Israelites after a, a, a win, a victory, hey, make a victory pile of stones right here, you know? The victory pile. And when you walk by that, you're going to remember, I was faithful then, I'll be faithful now. Do we have some victory piles in our lives? Yeah, we do. And it's good for us to go back and visit them. And if you have to make some victory piles in your home, I have examples of it, I don't have time to share. Do it, okay? Whatever that looks like for you, do something. Put a sticky note on your, on your mirror where you see it every morning and start a victory file, amen? And when you look at that, say, God, you're good. You're going to get me through because you got me through there and there and there. And I may not be where I want to be. I'm sure glad I'm not where I used to be. So what must each of us do before we actually enter into the fight? You know, we're talking about warfare. Now we, we want some weapons, right? Give me something to throw. Pull the knife. Want to see the end of my knife? Flat. I broke the tip off. So now it's a glorified screwdriver. All right? That's, that's what I use it for, literally. And it's dull as a, a knife that's been dull. Anyway, I didn't know what to fill that in with. Um, we want to jump in and go, whoa, what do I fight with? But you know, I think the first thing we got to discover is, which team are you going to be on? What team are you going to fight for? And you're thinking, dude, I'm at church. Don't insult my intelligence. I'm on God's team. Like going to McDonald's makes you a McNugget. No, just because you're in church means you still have to make a decision. Who am I going to fight for? It might sound like this. Perhaps we've chosen bitterness that destroys and separates me from God while I'm sitting in church and thinking all is well, but I've chosen hell. Literally, don't make me go through this again. God's clear in Matthew. If you choose to accept Jesus' forgiveness because of the cross and don't extend that to your neighbor, God says, depart from me. I don't know you because you truly don't get this at all. We need to come to that point where we can forgive our brother from our heart. Amen? So we need to choose 
aside and then step, Jesus, here I am, or step down. Because don't, don't try to pick up weapons you don't know how to use if we didn't choose aside. Choose to please yourself that brings destruction or choose to bring God, the Spirit, who brings eternal life. It's a choice. So I'm going to encourage you today, choose wisely which side you pick because I know the end of the book and one side gets to go north and the other side gets to go south. And I want to be on the Lord's side, and that is the W, the win column, the V, the victory column. Choose a side this morning, and then live like it with all your heart. Don't be lukewarm. Be fired up and filled up and useful. So we're going to see the clip from War Room right now where she, go ahead and hit that, where she actually understands, and she gets the revelation, I need to pick a side, and I must. You've been defeated. Go back to hell where you belong. It's the only time you can say that in your home, all right? The word hell, you know. I'm talking literal terms, right? Right, are you with me? How many of us are... Uh, in need of maybe going home and speaking that out loud. I'm not having you raise your hand. How many of us are in need of just, hey, Satan, I know you can hear me. You're a loser. Get out of my life. Get out of my way. Get out of my marriage. Get out of my home. Get out now in Jesus. And a victory comes. In that first part, she kept saying over and over, submit to God, submit to God, submit to God. Submit to God. What does it mean to submit to God? It just really, truly means place yourself under his authority. Right? You know, it's, it's bow the knee. I submit to your will, to your plans. I submit. If you take it in a stance of, uh, we're talking warfare, submission in a warfare setting would submit to the rank above me. I submit. It is obeying God. Simply put, obedience to Him. I've had a tough week. We've had a tough week. And I would put a little addition to submit. I would say submission is to accept the circumstances in your life. Does that compute for you? Accept him. Jesus, we celebrated last weekend that on Good Friday he's taking this cross and he, he embraces it. That is something he's about to die upon, yet he embraces the cross because he can see the finish line is salvation for you and me. Did Jesus ask if this cup could pass from him? Yes, he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he sweats blood as he asks God, hey, if there's another plan, hit me now, I'm open. But not my will, but yours be done. I'm not saying you need to like your circumstance that you're thinking about right now. That death, that loss, that situation financially, that burden of where am I going to be and how is this all going to work? I have no idea. That thing you're struggling with, I'm not saying you need to like it. You need to do what Jesus did and go to Gethsemane and fight this on your knees. It's spiritual warfare. And this is the time to wrestle with God and say, hey, I don't want to keep questioning everything in my life. Give me the plan and not my will, but yours be done. And embrace some of our situations, amen. I much quickly, much quicker heal in a situation where I say, okay, this has happened. 
I really can't change it, right? Complaining's not helping it at all. And I just need to embrace this change in my life and bring Jesus into it and work this through together. Because the longer I complain about it and I become embittered by it and I, I'm, I try to push it away or pretend it didn't happen, the longer turmoil results in my life and in yours. Amen? Submission. And then resist the devil and he will flee from you is the follow-up of James 4-7. Resist the devil. I think we know something about resistance in America in 2016. Resistance comes in your, in your car in the way of an alarm system, right? That's resistance. It resists your car from being tampered with, stolen, broken into. It will sound loud. Raise your hand if you have an alarm in your car in factory or aftermarket. Raise your hand. Yeah, many of you, most of you. You got a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar investment. In my case, I have a two hundred dollar investment. I'm trying to protect. You know what I mean? I doesn't care what, what what the monetary value of it is. You want to protect your car. How many of us have a deadbolt in your house? You locked your house when you left this morning. I hope you did. It's wisdom. Yeah, we want to protect our house. We know something about protecting our home, our car. Maybe you got a sign like this at your place. I'm gonna read that for you just in case. You cannot make that out. It says this. Prayer is the best way to meet the Lord. Trespassing is even faster. There's a picture of a gun on it. Do you see that? Now I want you to guess whose house that's at. Go. You blew that for me. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Never mind guessing. It was just told to you. It's my in-laws. It's my in-laws house. Particularly, it's my mother-in-law's sign. I'm not kidding. It, it's her sign with a gun pointing at your head. Trespassers will get there even faster. Do you know, I think she, she has this sign up for my kids. <laughs> because she keeps a little stash of those uh, ice cream sandwiches at her house. And they keep sliding over and picking those off. So I think this was for them, actually. Has she shot at you guys yet? Hmm? Not yet. All right, good. I think we also know something about not letting people break into our lives with what they say. Like, like if somebody said something bad on, on Facebook, we'd be like, oh, yeah, take this. <laughs> Send. I feel justified. It's terrible, isn't it? We, it's what we do. Somebody blows up your text, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to blow you up. What did we do? We didn't accomplish anything. Jesus, what did he model for us? Before his accusers, he was. I couldn't hear. He's not even defending himself. Take notes. How to respond to controversy. I think we know how to defend our home our car, our reputation, what others think of us. And then we completely miss the obvious real enemy of our lives. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we do nothing on our knees. And you don't have to be on your knees to pray. It's just one of those things we use to let you know we're talking about prayer, all right? I seldom pray on my knees because my knees hurt, okay? So I pray standing. But we seldom go to God in prayer and cast the enemy out of our home or cast the enemy out of our marriage. Hey, if you got harshness going on between you and your spouse, that's not her and that's not me. That's the enemy just playing games. And while you're nitpicking one another, he leaves the situation and lets you take over and finds his next victim. When will we get it and say, I'm done fighting you and fighting you and I'm going to fight you and you are damned to hell and you are finished messing with me. Get out of my life. 
And in Jesus' name, I give you this home. In Jesus' name, I give you my car. In Jesus' name, I give you my circumstances of life. In Jesus' name, I give you my hardship. In Jesus' name, I give you the victories that you have so blessed me with. In Jesus' name, I want to live a life that honors you. In Jesus' name, I want love to return to my situation and my life. You know, some have been struggling with a smoking habit here. We've talked about it several weeks. And some of us had a conversation yesterday about how, okay, we're, we're anti enough to the next level. We're done. Amen? We're done. And, and if you want to jump on that, that ship of, I'm done with that. Satan, you have no authority over me with these death sticks. Amen? In Jesus' name, cast them out. And while you're casting that, cast the cigarettes with it. Right? Woo! Cast them. They're not doing you any favors. And there's going to be a, a leader being raised up from amongst us that's going to lead a, a little SA, a little Smokers Anonymous group. We got AA, you know what that is. We got SA now. SA, Smokers Anonymous. Doesn't even have to be anonymous. Just do it, get in there, let it be put to death. Amen? Whew. What are some things that we need to let God in to take care of? Wednesday night in our lives, and I'll finish up here. Wednesday night, Monday was ouch. Sunday was awesome. Okay, last Sunday, but let's start there. Easter Sunday. Victory formation. God just met with us. We had a great time. Monday, pain and suffering started slipping in. Tuesday, more. Wednesday, I had enough. You know, I was into the 20s as I'm thinking through all the things that have gone wrong. I, I don't think I could think of one thing that went right. I'm laying on the bed next to my wife, 9, 10 p.m. I said, what are we doing wrong? And she said, well, we're not praying. We're not praying about this. We haven't cast the devil out of anything. Just kind of letting him have his way. Well, don't, don't make it sound like it's my fault. Aren't you so spiritual? That was my first thought. That's how you know the enemy's still working, right? Just time that out. I don't care who had the thought first. Roll with it, right? And say, you're right, baby. Let's pray. And we started just praying and casting them out and saying there's no vacancy here and, and letting oppression go. And you know what? When we were done, None of my circumstances had time to change yet. Amen? They didn't. But what changed was me. And what changed was her. And the oppression was leaving. And I walked through the house just praying out loud. Some of your kids look at you like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> it's okay. Let them see you praying out loud. It's okay. And just committing our house to God. Committing my cars to God. My car is still in the shop. My truck. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing with it. Continue to bless it. Amen. Bless me when I go to pay for it. <laughs> with finances. Um, you know, What's that? Yeah, yeah, think of the gas I'm saving. Bless my son's car that I keep using. Sorry. <laughs> Again, I leave you with this. Submit yourselves to God, and he wants to do something great with you and your stuff. He has your best interests at heart. And then re resist the devil. We know how to resist everything else. Let's, restart, let's start resisting this one. Amen? Resist the devil, and he must flee. He must flee now. Because we're in a spiritual battle and because we're beginning to understand that, the Bible says we need to put on the full armor of God so that when evil comes against us, we can stand against the evil. What does it mean when it says the full armor of God? That is a fantastic Greek word. 
that we had to put a phrase to, the full armor of God. See, in the Greek military, they had several different types of armor, okay? And they had different types of armor were used for different soldiers who had different tasks, and they had different pieces of the armor that they used. They had one particular type of armor that they used that was a complete set of armor. It had everything they needed for a soldier to win the battle all by himself with the offensive weapons that were needed and the defensive weapons that were needed. And it's that particular word that's used for that kind of armor in the Greek military that is used in this scripture, the full armor of God. Everything you need to win the battle that you are in, God has given it to you. All the defensive weapons you need to resist the devil. All the offensive weapons you need to resist the devil. God has given you everything you need to win the battle that you are facing. He's already won the battle. Jesus won the battle when he died on a cross and when he rose from the grave, he conquered and he defeated the enemy. He defeated Satan. And so he's given us everything we need because he's already won the battle. And so we're not fighting for, for the victory. We're fighting from the victory he's already won. Did you get that? We're fighting not for victory because it's already been won. We're fighting from the victory of Christ. And that's powerful. That means we have authority in Christ if we have accepted him as our Savior. But you need to choose to use the armor that he's provided for you. Because a soldier is not going to be very effective in battle if his armor is laying on the ground beside him and his weapons are leaning up against a tree, right? That's happened in hunting a few times. <laughs> That's happened in hunting. We're not very effective if our gun is on the ground and we're up in a tree stand, right? Uh -huh. In the same way, we're not effective if we aren't going to put on the full armor of God. He's provided it. That's why it says, you're in a spiritual battle. Put it on. Use it. Pick it up and carry it with you. And take it with you. Pray this armor over you every single day. What does it look like? Verse 14 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I would love right now to go through every single one of those and explain the symbolism and what they mean and how it means to it spiritually, but there's not time for that. And so this is what we're going to do. We have enclosed within this that you'll find on the website a link to a really fantastic study on each of these. Find your own fantastic study throughout this week and learn what it means and begin to pray this armor over you every single morning before you go out into your day. It's fantastic. It's exciting when you begin the revelation of understanding what the Word of God is saying to us about this. But according to Paul, there's something else other than all of these things of armor. And a lot of times it gets left out in these studies because we're so focused on the armor and what they mean. But there's something else. There's something else in our armor in order to be fully equipped for spiritual battle. In fact, it's our greatest weapon. And he says it in verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. What do you mean all kinds of prayers and requests? I mean... Prayer is prayer. You're talking to God. It's prayer. What you, there's different kinds? Yes. And there throughout Scripture, different kinds of prayers are listed and talked about and taught about. We're only going to touch on a couple of them this morning. The first one we're going to look at is agreeing prayer. Agreeing prayer. And that is found in the book of Matthew. Jesus told his disciples, Truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth Agree about anything they ask for. It will be done for them in my, by my Father in heaven. Agreement, when we agree with each other, it invites God's presence into our prayers. Where two or more are gathered, God is there, right? This is why we have corporate prayer. This is why we have prayer nights once in a while, because there's more power when we gather together and pray. This is why we encourage you to come, because we want you to experience the power that's in the prayer of a corporate group of people when we are agreeing together in prayer and God's presence is there in powerful ways. That doesn't mean God's not with you when you're alone praying. He is with you, and he hears your prayers when you're alone praying. And you need to do that. 
This is a different type of prayer, agreeing prayer, praying corporately. This is why we share prayer requests, so we can agree together in prayer. Another type of prayer is persevering prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up in prayer until there's a breakthrough. And sometimes we just have to stay on our knees until we feel the release of God in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he starts by teaching them the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven. So he teaches them the Lord's Prayer and then immediately goes into the story. And he says that there was a man who went to his neighbor one night and he was knocking on his door for some bread. And he kept knocking and knocking. And the neighbor said, I'm not coming to the door. It's too late. My kids are in bed. I'm not answering the door. And Jesus says very clearly in Luke 11, 8, he says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because he's your friend, yet because of your shameless audacity, in other words, because of your persistence, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. That just means to come to God without being ashamed of asking. He's your daddy. And he has everything you need. Go ask him and ask him some more and ask him again without being ashamed or embarrassed to ask him because he loves you. God loves you. And he wants to bless you. Ask him. The next type of prayer we're quickly going to look at is intercessory prayer. Warfare prayer is not always about our own issues. Sometimes God calls us and leads us to pray for others because they are overwhelmed or they are at risk and we need to lift them up in prayer. Many of you were interceding for us this week because you knew we had a tough week, because we knew we had a long drive to Ohio with my parents and we had a hard funeral. And you were lifting us up in prayer. Thank you. We felt those prayers because we were at risk. We were overwhelmed and exhausted and we needed you. I have a college roommate that will ran randomly text me and say, woke up this morning with you heavy on my heart, praying for you, don't know what's going on, love you, know you're in my prayers. Sometimes we're like, wow, God really showed her because there's some major stuff going on. At other times, we're like, wow, I'm glad we didn't know what was going on, whatever she saved us from, because we didn't even, we're having a great day. And, you know, so we just know that those are times that God is leading somebody to pray. And, and many of you are doing that with each other. And that's intercessory prayer. The prophet Ezekiel teaches us that God looks for people to build a wall or, and stand in the gap. That terminology, you've probably heard it said, I'm praying a hedge of protection. That's what that means. It's a wall. It's a hedge. It's like a, a city with a wall around mm -hmm. it. Picture whoever you're praying for in the center, and you're going to pray a wall of protection around them. And if there's a gap in that wall, you're going to stand in it. And no enemy's going to pass by you because you're standing in that gap, and you're praying. And God looks for us to do that. That's what the Bible says. He's looking for us to stand in the gap and pray for each other. That's intercessory prayer. And then finally, the prayer of praise. This is powerful. When we were ministering on the road, and we would go from church to church, and we would do a service, and we'd sing, and, and then we'd speak. And, and sometimes, at, well, most of the time at the end, there would be an altar call. And our brother-in-law, Todd, he'd give the altar call, and he'd ask his wife to come up, and Diane would be playing piano. And PR would come up, and he would sing. Um, we each had our job right then. He would sing the altar call song. My job right then was to sit on the front pew and pray. And I would pray for the people in the room. And I would pray about the topic we just preached about. I would pray about the people, the situations I knew were happening in the room, if I knew about them. And I would pray however the Lord led me to pray. And sometimes there was a hardness in the room that seemed like we couldn't get past it. We just, the Holy Spirit was there, but it wasn't breaking through. It, people weren't letting the wall down. And, and, and those, those are the times God led me to praise. And I would just begin to praise, Lord, you are awesome, God. You are holy. You are powerful. You are mighty. And every single time, it's like that, that hardness began to melt away. And people began to move one at a time. And the altars eventually would be filled. But it was because of praise. Because when there is praise, the enemy can't stand it. When you're praising God, he can't stand it. The enemy can't stand it. And he has to leave. And he runs. So if you're having a hard time resisting the devil, start praising right out loud Amen. because he would have to flee then. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, King Jehoshaphat goes out to war against some countries who were attacking them. And before the armies went out, before he sent the armies, he sent the worship team in front of them. Thanks a lot, right? Ah. Wow, great. That's the first line of defense right there. 
Second Chronicles 20, 21 says, After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing in praise, get this, they began to sing in praise. The Bible says the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Three other countries were coming against them who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. All they did was sing and praise. And there was so much confusion in the other camps that they ended up annihilating each other. And the guys who were in the army behind the worship team, they didn't even have to get their weapons out. The victory was won solely on worship and praise. And God wants to do that in our lives. And so the prayer of praise is a powerful one. Don't forget it. Ephesians 6, 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Don't fall asleep. Don't decide to take a break. Keep praying. It is your most powerful weapon. How many of us uh, have a cartoon to a, a Christian radio station? Amen. Many. Um, or we have a Christian CD or something in that uh, reminds us who God is. That's powerful. You know, thinking of powerful stuff, in defending myself, I'm pretty proactive at defending my home. Um, I hunt. I have three shotguns that are 12 gauge. I have several other shotguns that are other gauges. They're placed strategically through my home, and they have tactical lights, and they have tactical gear. If you're going to break into my home, you don't want me home. Uh, you know what I mean? Declare yourself. Because I will come at you in force to protect my family. Why do I say that? I say that because of this. As much as I might have force with something in the human, it compares not to the power you have available to you in prayer. Amen? It is your greatest weapon, is the prayers of God's people. And if we would allow God to do something that only He can do, He's going to come and take care of business in that hardship that you're dealing with this week. That thing that you said, yeah, that was mine. That's why I keep putting a question mark where God put a period, and I haven't understood what God's doing there. Maybe you have a young person that is uh, a son or a daughter, a niece or nephew, or somebody you're dealing with that you know is just far from God, and you want to break into their lives with Jesus, but you don't, you don't know how to do it. You do it in prayer. Amen? We ask God of the universe to be God, and we don't become God, right? There's nothing I'm going to do or say that's going to be able to talk somebody into it. It's what we do in prayer, standing in the gap, as my wife said, for those we love and care about.